Welcome to Board Gamers Anonymous, the podcast of board gamers and the insane fun we have at the table together. This is Chris. And this is Anthony. And this is episode 468, March Gamer Madness. Popular themes that are not IPs. We'd like to thank all our Patreon backers for helping us bring you a brand new episode. Hey friends, we're back. And it is that time of year. All the madness. But this time, the madness is about board games. Because we're a board game podcast. Yes, yes, it's our own special brand of madness. It is not the other kind of madness, which is legally distinct <laughs> for all intents and purposes. Uh, don't want to hear about it. This is our madness. We've had it for a while. We did. Ergo the podcast name. It's It's been with us quite some time. It's not going anywhere. So we're going to stick with it, play into it, and monetize it. Because you know what? It's March Gamer Madness. So as we mentioned last week, we are talking about the IPs. I'm sorry. Not the IPs, the against the IPs. We're not we're not playing with the IPs. We're playing with the themes in board gaming that have taken over board gaming from time to time. And we have decided that in the end, there can be only one. Which one? I don't know. We'll find out. That's why you're listening to this episode. Yes, yes, yes. So we're gonna pit eight of these themes against each other. We have cats. We have yeah. zombies. Uh we have aliens, Woo. robots. Does not compute, Anthony. Does not compute. <laughs> uh, samurai. Hi. We have the Western conglomerate. I, I wrote in knights, but it's just a bunch of stuff. European medieval. <laughs> here, here. <laughs> yeah. Vikings. And yar, yar, <laughs> yar. And cowboys. Yeehaw! <laughs> there you go. That's an easy one. There you go. Uh, so we have eight games from each of these. Um, each bracket or section of the bracket, region of the bracket, is going to be two of them facing off against each other. And we're going to boil it down until we get to just one game representing one popular theme. Ooh. And in the end, there could be only one ultimate popular theme. Heck so. yeah. I mean, we've debated this for quite some time. We've talked about this over many years. There seems to be different waves that come in and out and then back again. And we just wanted to have a little fun trying to figure out which is the best, which one deserves to be on the top of the tops. And, you know, gracing your games, especially when they do reprints. Because when they do reprints, more times than not, they're like, hey, what's the hot thing? Okay, cool. That's the theme for that game. So, yeah. Take your abstract and slap a slap paste the theme on it. It yep. might be one of these. Yep, yep. Right at the moment, cats. In the future, <laughs> who knows? It's a lot of fun nonetheless. So you'll be joining with us. And Anthony, before we get on to the fun, a little bit of news on our end. Uh BG Academics. We have a call for proposals. We do. We do. If you are an academic in the academic space, adjacent to the academic space, a practitioner who uses tabletop games professionally, um, and all, any and all of the above, and you are interested in presenting your research and or writing a paper about it, uh, submit a proposal. We have uh, our call for proposals is open through the second week of April. Um, we'll be reaching out to people and uh, selecting our, our next wave of uh submissions for 2024 and 2025 um by the end of the month so check it out uh it's on boardgameacademics.com slash submissions and i'm um, looking forward to, to reading everybody's submissions absolutely and on april 6th and 7th at the cradle of aviation in garden city new york we'll be attending a special guest the long island tabletop where we'll be running two presentations one on level up your teach. So we all know teaching a game is essential to our hobby and we all have to be ambassadors of the hobby by teaching games to newbies so that we get more people into the hobby. So more people to play games, but there is tricks and tips and there's better ways to kind of bring people into the hobby and to teach those games. So you'll be joining us in a panel of experts to talk about all of the great things that you can do to get those games to the table, taught properly, and then hopefully get repeat customers. 
And then on Sunday, we'll be doing Level Up Your Mental Health. So it turns out tabletop gaming is excellent for your mental health in so many different ways, personally, socially, and just brings a big community together. So we'll be talking about how to utilize tabletop games in your own better mental health for yourself, for your partners and friends, and for the community at large. So again, Long Island Tabletop is going to be coming up on April 6th and 7th. We hope that we'll see you there. And we'll also have tables in the uh, tabletop area with our friends Game Master Dave and Ginger. So we're looking forward to meeting you there. All right, everyone. So that's everything that's happened with us. Let's get on to it. Let's hit our bracket, Anthony. What do we have starting off? All right. Uh, our first region, our first section, our first quarter of this is Cats versus Zombies. Yeah, this is a tough one because Cats are the newcomers. Uh, they clawed their way up to the top. But Zombies, they also know how to claw their way out of the grave, Anthony. A lot of clawing going on here. <laughs> Both clawing at each other. I would yes. take a cat times a thousand over over a zombie. I'm just, wow. just saying. Like, how about take cat, my zombies? cat Cat zombies. Take my cat and like, take care of the zombie. <laughs> zombie cat? No. Zombie cats. No, 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 no. You're gonna give me nightmares. No good. <laughs> you never saw Pet Cemetery? No, because I don't, don't want to see no zombie cats. <laughs> don't 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 watch the original one. Don't read the book either by Stephen King. It's Ugh. yeah, it's yeah. Zombie cats, man. That's all I'm saying. Uh no, thank you. <laughs> so <laughs> So let's kick it off here. We have each of these matchups is going to be a cat game versus a zombie game. We have eight of these. So first up, we have the number one seed in this section. Uh, seeds are based on the ranking on Board Game Geek, sometimes adjusted a little bit by us to fit uh, the matchups. But uh, this is by far the highest rated of these 16, and that is the Isle of Cats. Number one versus number 16, Run, Fight, or Die. So wow. Yes, in Isle of Cats, you are rescuing cats from an island <laughs> on which they all live, <laughs> and you have to fit them on your ship. So it is a drafting game in which you take these little meeples, or I'm sorry, you take the tiles, and you place them on your ship in a polyominoes type layout, um, and then you have these various cards that allow you to do that, as well as score in different ways. Um, there are many, many, many different ways to play this game, even just out of the main box, but with multiple expansions. There's a roll and write version of it there's like a lighter family version of it there's even a new like race to the raft which is kind of a cooperative experience uh, but at the end of the day you've got you've got cat polyominoes that's what you're dealing with here mm -hmm. um versus run fight or die which is a richard lanius game uh, which is all about running and fighting or dying <laughs> <laughs> to whom? To, zombies. to whom? To zombies. There you go. Yeah, yeah. No, there's there's some zombies. It's a dice rolling push your like type of game. Um, so you're rolling dice, you're locking them in, but it's more than like zombie dice. There's other things going on. You've got like miniatures on different boards. They're moving around, interacting with the, the zombies that are chasing you. Um, it's it's a it's a. I almost said cute. That's not the right word for any zombie game, but it's quick i guess is the best way to put that it's small and accessible and quick um doesn't ever say it's welcome yeah that's a lot of fun especially when it comes to a zombie game yeah yeah i think so um all right so on my end uh-huh we all know the answer to this it is uh -huh. cats i love me some cats in this game <laughs> i have a love-hate relationship with actual cats but in this game um they're cute they're like little fantasy cats and I, I, I really like the combination of, well, there's a ton of artwork, but just the combination of like the different jokes and, and visuals on the cards mm -hmm. with mechanics. Well, Anthony, I'm going to go with my man. You know, he's my man. It's Richard Lanius. And if he wants to run, fight or die with zombies, I'm with him. So I'm going with the zombie game. All right. So as we do every year and it, if you participated in our contest, thank you for being part of that. Um, you are up for a chance to win a game. Um, so we're going to go to the, the, the contest entries to break the tie. Um, and our, our wonderful software here tells me exactly how many votes there were. Um, there were zero votes for Run Fighter Tie. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, not a, it's, it's a decent game, people. You should play it. Seriously. Yeah. <laughs> so 100% of 
the uh, the voters said Isle of Cats. Oh man, the cats are getting in your brains, people. Yeah, probably, but. <laughs> All right, it's a, well, it's a it, good game versus a mediocre zombie game. I mean, come on, it's for Shalanius, man. Come on, it's got a lot of mediocre games. No, they're all good. <laughs> no, they're not. <laughs> Cats, on the other hand, are suspicious to say the least. True. At least you know where you stand with a zombie. All right, so Isle of, Isle of Cats moves on to the next round. All right, uh, next up we have Zombie Kids Evolution. This is a uh, legacy style zombie game for kids in which you have kind of the small board and these various standees that are fight fighting off a horde of zombies um comes with a bunch of little envelopes and stickers and i I can say from personal experience that my daughter loves it uh the games are like 15 minutes long so you can sit and play three or four in a row and just knock out and unlock a bunch of stuff which i think is kind of ideal for a legacy game to be able to unlock stuff quickly Mm -hmm. um and it's just like a very classic zombie experience. Just horde after horde after horde. Um, up against Boop. Number oh. nine. The <laughs> Boop. So uh, this is a recent release from uh, Smirk and... I think it's under their laughter. <laughs> <laughs> Smirk and Dagger, Smirk and Laughter. Who knows? Um, designed by Scott Brady. And it, in it, you have cats trying to knock each other off of a bed. That is it. It's cute. Um, very popular little abstract game, uh, little cat meeples, mm-hmm. and uh, there's several versions of it now as well with the boop and boop the halls. <laughs> so, what do you think? Uh, both of these are very good, and both of these take what is generally kind of like pretty basic stuff and really put a nice twist on this. I got to play boop, not the original boop, but the boop with the with the ghost cats. And it's a lot of cuteness. Uh, so I'm going to go boop or boop as, you know, most people call it. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I'm with you on that. I like I like z- zombie kids and, and zombie teens as well, which is a sequel to that. Um, but they are, you know, it's legacy experience kind of it's not one and done because there's like a million games in the box. But it's also fairly simple, right? It's it's less about the zombies, and more about what the kids can do because it is a kid's game. So I'm yeah. going to go with boop as well. All right. Well, Boop moves on to the next round. All right. Uh, next up, we have number five, Cat in the Box Deluxe Edition versus number 12, Hit Z Road. Mm. Um, so Cat in the Box is a trick-taking game out of Japan by designer Munuyuki Yokuchi, um, in which there are no suits. You choose the suit when you play the cards, and then there's a whole like paradox, paradox mechanism based on when you play and what you can and cannot play. It's a bit of a brain burner. It takes some time to figure out. The cat really has nothing to do with the mechanics, but it's <laughs> yes. on every card, there is a black cat. Um, and then they made the giant version with a giant black cat. So it's it's more like the mascot of the game than anything else. Um, Hit Z Road is a Martin Wallace game um, from 2016, in which you are taking a road trip down Route 66 and dealing with some zombies because of reasons. Uh, So you decided to go on a road trip from Chicago uh, down to the Southwest and there are zombies in the way. So you have to deal with this random deck of adventure cards, dealing with different zombies. There's some very cool artwork here. It's kind of reminiscent of like old 50s nostalgia. Um, And it's a little bit of a dice chucker as well i don't know why everybody wants dice chucking in their zombie games all three of them so far are dice chuckers but um it's one of the more interesting ones thematically i almost said mechanically but thematically yeah well i I, again makes a lot of sense two good games i the cat as you mentioned anthony the cat theme is a little thin in cat in the box because other than the, the fact that cats are uh pretty tricky and obviously you don't know whether they're in the box or out of the box or what's going on inside the box obviously uh the one that i did enjoy a lot more and got a lot more fun at was cat in the box the deluxe edition yeah yeah me too it's the cat adds a lot even, even though it's not really like part of the mechanics of what you're doing but it's it creates something out of what could just be a mathematical experience it feels like a thing so 
And you know, it's a fun joke on Schrodinger's cat. So yes, and again, there cannot be enough jokes about that because, yeah, <laughs> poor cat. Yeah. Physics jokes are funny. <laughs> they are. It's, it's it's next level, man. You wouldn't yeah. understand it. It's it's both you know funny and not at the same time. Ex- exactly. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> that poor cat. Yeah. All right. All right. So Cat in the Box Deluxe Edition moves on to next round. All right. Um, so next up, we have a very interesting matchup. Um, and I say interesting, I mean, like, it's weird. Uh, <laughs> number four, Zombicide Black Plague. And uh-huh. you might say, why Black Plague? Well, it's because it's the Zombicide I like the most, and I made the list. So oh. there you go. There are 16 different Zombicide releases. Um, pick your poison. I think this is the best one. So here you go. It's medieval fantasy uh, with zombies. I think once they went medieval, really once they got out of like modern day, whatever tropes with like season six or seven or whatever they were on. Sure. I, I found that the whole system a lot more interesting. Um, so it's zombie side. You're running around. You have six different characters fighting off hordes of zombies. There's a lot of other mechanics to get in there as well. But that's basically it. Um, versus number 13, Nekujima, <laughs> yeah. which we just played a couple weeks ago. Yeah, that's um, true. it is a dexterity game in which you are placing these different poles with electrical wires connecting them, and then periodically you have to hang cats from the electrical wires or place little cat meeples on top of the electrical poles to block other people from from doing it. Um, like any dexterity game, when they all fall down, you lose. Uh, so very, very different games. <laughs> yeah, and and you have to admit this time, Anthony, the cats are jerks. Cats are jerks in this game. <laughs> jerks. You, yeah. When you pull one of the little black the cubes, it's yes. it's it's not good. It's not No, good. you're like, damn it, it's a cat. <laughs> Why? <laughs> cat. Yeah. And then placing them on the the the, the power lines, because I don't know why, but that's a thing, supposedly. Uh obviously. Oof. Yeah. I don't know. I, I again Nekojima was one of the games where I really felt the tension because I guess cats are really unpredictable and problematic. But Zombie Black Plague, I guess as representative of all the zombies, is obviously one of, if not the best, zombie side. So I guess Zombicide Black Plague. Yeah, I think it's funny. I I almost want to go with Nekojima because I'm like, this is the game where the cats are jerks. Like, this, yeah. is, this is cats. This it's is more cats true are. to the catness. Yeah, I but it, but it is it is like it's zombie side. We get, I feel like if I if they didn't do this, if it was just zombie side, I'd be like, cool, knock them out. But Black Plague's pretty good, so I'm gonna go with that. Yeah, I think Zombicide over the years, like, there's certainly been an evolution. The the we played the first way back in the day, and. Eh, but obviously, it, it really, especially this version, right. has made it made it into like a real a game, right? All right, so Zombicide Black Plague Edition moves on to next round. All right, uh, next up we have number six, Dawn of the Zeds. This is designed by Herman Lutman um, and published by Victory Point Games. And if you've never heard of this, it's because it is primarily played as a one player experience. Um, it plays one to five. It does do that, but it, it's also just if you go to the top solo games, or, which gets run every year on Board Game Geek, it's like number four or five. Um, people love this game, and it is all things zombies, right? It's got like that Dawn of the Dead vibe to it, visually speaking, um, and just like a lot of different ways to engage with that. In in and admittedly a pretty fun experience. Like it's not the dice chucker that we're dealing with with a lot of these, right? All the mm-hmm. other ones so far, you're throwing dice. This one yes. is like card-based and map-based, and there's a lot more of a puzzle to it as you try to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, that makes it more interesting. So it is a, a very solid game that happens to have a, a zombie theme to it. Sure. Um, up against kind of the opposite, number 11, Exploding Kittens, <laughs> <laughs> which is barely a game. Um, <laughs> so it's it's basically Russian roulette with, stupid cat jokes on the cards and that is about all i can say about it um Um, soon to get its own netflix special coming up for some reason why (laughs) and all the Um, money it made on kickstarter remember all those years ago it did it made a lot of money i i cannot ignore that we have received (laughs) 
three copies of this for the kids for various birthdays over the years. Um, they all go into a box somewhere. <laughs> oh my god! And then are they can... packed away by important men and placed into mm-hmm. a place with other boxes and crates of things that never be? I, yeah. I wish, man. I don't know where they are. They're probably in the basement somewhere. But, um, exploded kittens. We all, yeah, it's it's, it's, it's exploding <laughs> kittens. There's cats. I cats like the jerks. drawings yeah. because it's from from the oatmeal guy, but it's. it's yeah the artwork is very good the game itself is what i would say about the game itself is the artwork is very good that's yes. what i would say about yeah. the game <laughs> yeah i'll jump in here and maybe we're on the same page when we're not but i think dawn of the zeds is actually a brilliant game yes i it's also an extremely good interpretation of the early zombie movies that made all of this possible um, uh-huh. exploding kittens is significantly more popular but yes. i don't think it's very good or fun Absolutely. So, yes, that means Dawn of the Zeds moves on to the next round. All right. Um, Okay, next up we have number three, Calico, which is a abstract game in which you are placing uh, quilt tiles onto this board. You fill it up, and you're trying to match various different patterns. As you match various different patterns, cats will come and fall asleep on your quilt. Uh, So that's why it's called Calico. If you play the digital version, there are cats Everywhere. They are yes. in your way. They are blocking the visuals. You can't see where you're clicking all the time. I'm not a fan of that, but there are cats everywhere. There's kind of a cat um, cult on top of that. In oh, the, right. In the video yeah, the game. weird solo. The, the, yeah. Yeah. A weird game. Um, <laughs> so it's you're sewing a quilt, and the cat sleeps on it. It's very cute. Uh, on the flip side, we have number 14, City of Horror, which re-implements Mall of Horror, and later re-implemented by Lockdown. But Basically, you have a big sprawling player elimination type of game. It's a back, it's a survival horror game, but you can kind of stab each other in the back. Um, <laughs> so if if you take the mean part of Dead of Winter and that that's just the whole game, that's what yeah. this is. Uh, except I think this came out before that. So <laughs> this is just someone being like, "Yeah, how would you survive the zombie apocalypse?" Like, I throw my friend under the bus. It's <laughs> wow. it's that the game. That's funny. Like so, I know several people who love this. I do not. I don't like it at all. But it is true to the theme. It is true to the theme. Uh, although I will say that Calico is one of the cat games that I do like a lot. Uh, even though it has a cat cult and a war going on for some particular reason, but <laughs> uh, it's 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 quite a good game, and uh, the cats are nicely integrated in what is generally a, a basic abstract. Yeah, I, I love Calico. It's it's one of my favorites. So that's that's an easy one for me. All right. Calico moves on to the next round. All right. Uh, next up, we have number seven, Cat Lady, designed uh-huh. by Josh Wood. <laughs> art by Josh Wood. Um, and Josh Wood does a lot of stuff for AEG. So mm-hmm. we have Cat Lady. We have Let's Go to Japan, um, Santa Monica. Uh, this is the one that I think they became big for. Uh, mm-hmm. And it is uh, Your Cat Ladies. Yeah, you have all these different cat cards, and you're trying to basically draft them, build up the most lovable collection of cats to be a lady of. Um, so it's like a tableau builder type of thing. Uh, that is going up against number ten, Tiny Epic Zombies, which is <laughs> I don't know what is this number six or seven in the line of Tiny Epic games. I just I um, it doesn't end. Yeah, so it's it's a cooperative game. Mm-hmm. But also has a competitive mode, free for all mode. Yeah. Um, also, there's a solo mode. So it has five different modes. So you know it's a good game. Um, <laughs> very well balanced. The meeples are uh, cute. <laughs> yeah, the meeples are cute. I love the little zombie meeples. Um, yeah. It takes place at a mall because if you're going to do stereotypical zombie, you got to do it in a mall. Typically um, in Pittsburgh, too, by the way. Yes. Yeah. yeah. No, I actually, I knew a couple people back in Pittsburgh who were in uh, one of those movies. Ah, nice. Uh, so much older than me, obviously. But. <laughs> Um, well, to be so, fair, they they weren't, and then they became undead. So yeah, I, I guess. Oh, true. I guess we're so, the same age. Mm-hmm. Uh, so yeah, it's it's zombies in a mall, and it's tiny epic, which you know it's hit or miss. This is actually one of the better ones, I think, of of the last few years. Mm-hmm. Um, it's not great. None of them are great. There's a couple that are great. Most of them are fine. Um, so it's an interesting matchup here because both of these games are like. Solid sevens. I don't. I don't know which, uh, which way I would lean on this. 
Yeah. I would say the only... The tiny epic stuff, as you said, they range from like a five to seven, depending on the game that came out. This one, and usually visual appeal is really what kind of, you know, pushes it over a little bit more. But typically they're not tiny. Um, Epic, I guess it's up for debate, so to speak. But it's, it's also something that I've seen and played before with better stuff. So... It needed to be a little more tiny to be a little more epic for my taste. And surprisingly, Cat Lady. Uh, I don't know how they do it, but it's a decent little game. And it's a tableau builder. And it's all about everything having to do with cats. So when I think cats, I think cat ladies. Uh, and you too, Anthony. And also cat guys. So yeah. Cat right. Lady. Cat Lady. Yeah, I'm, I'm okay with that. I, I think... Yeah, I just really don't like the tiny epic games. So let's let's go with Cat Lady. There you go. Cat Lady moves on to the next round. I think we're agreeing too much here. Uh well, you know, it's a thing. <laughs> Gotta get on that. <laughs> uh number two. This is the last matchup in this in this section. Number two, Dead of Winter, a crossroads game. You knew it was on here. We just had to get to it. Mm-hmm. Um this is the this is the zombie game, or at least it was when it first came out. Like sure. this was the hottest game in the world for like three or four years. Um, I haven't really seen or heard as much about it of late, but mm-hmm. I, I know it's still very popular just based on the number of plays on Board Game Geek. It is a semi cooperative game in which you are all trying to survive the zombie apocalypse, but there's the crossroad system, which can result in somebody having a different win objective than you and becoming kind of the traitor amongst the group. But you never mm. really know if that's going to happen or who it might be. Um, very interesting experience. It definitely evokes the emotion and kind of anxiety of a zombie experience um, in a way that a lot of these games don't. Because again, they're all just dice. Um, <laughs> and, that, and that's going up against number 15, Heir to the Pharaoh mm-hmm. um, by Alf Siegert from Eagle Griffin Games. And it is a game in which the Pharaoh decides that he's going to alter the lines of succession and put a cat up <laughs> for the next um, Pharaoh because he doesn't like his kids very much. Nice. Uh, so makes sense. Cats, of course, being sacred in ancient Egypt. So you you will have to deal with that. So it is a two player only game. Um, you play as Bast and Anubis, each vying for the Pharaoh's mm. attention and affection. Um, it's a cute, fun, little, mostly abstract type of game but i just i love the theme of it where you're like these ancient egyptian cats trying to make the pharaoh the happiest um the cat stuff is it could have been anything but i i do like i do like that they went with it sure yeah it's it's nice to see eagle griffin does a great production the cats and and the pieces are really nicely done the difference is i think for me dead of winter the crossroads system is great here and zombies I, you know, I'm not, I don't tend to be a fan of zombie games, but the zombies really play into the atmosphere of the game and it lets you focus on the characters and their, and their decisions. So I think it succeeds on what for me personally is the zombie aesthetic, which is this, the world has literally kind of somewhat ended and this is, this is an apocalypse, right? This is an apocalypse world. And this is what it's done to the people. And again, there's a lot of symbolism and metaphors and so forth and so on. But you really do feel like the people in that game dealing with the zombie horde and in a more realistic way. Again, a lot of the games are, you know, run around shooting or hack and slash things. I think it does a very good job. It's kind of a super upgrade for, you know, from zombie kids to this. Right. So. Um, I played it a lot, enjoyed it a lot, so that's going to be my vote. Dead of Winter, a crosswords game. Yeah, I, th- I think it has to be. Like it, it's it's just a legitimate great game. I don't I don't like a lot of zombie games. So this is one that I would happily play every time. All right, that means Dead of Winter, a crossroads game, moves on to the next round. All right, uh, so that moves us on to the next group of games, which is Aliens versus Robots. Ooh, that's going to so, end well. <laughs> no. <laughs> hey, at least we're not in it. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> Y'all have fun with each other. Um, so uh these are 
again, games primarily featuring aliens um, versus games primarily featuring robots. Now, to varying degrees, because there aren't as many of these directly as we would like. Uh, so first up, we have number one, again, the highest rated game on Board Game Geek, uh, Nemesis, mm-hmm. which is basically Alien, the movie Alien as a board game. Legally distinct. Um, legally distinct, of course. Um, and it's Awakened Realm, so there's like four million cards and miniatures <laughs> and stuff everywhere. And I I have not actually played this game. I've kind of just hovered and watched it. But it's survival horror sci-fi game. Yeah. Right? So, good stuff. Um, versus number 16, Mechanica. Uh, so, this is designed by um, a trio of people, including Mary Flanagan, who's uh, kind of a well-known speaker um, in the, the board game space. And it is a about building a robot factory. So you have all these different interlocking puzzle pieces. It's kind of this interactive experience, and you're building a factory to generate robots. Um, got a kind of a cool like puzzle piece layout as you build up your own infrastructure, shipping the robots to the to the trucks. Um, so very, very much in the automata uh, mm. realm of things. So very different games here. Very much. Like complete opposite game aesthetics and play. Yeah. Kind of. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard. I I think Nemesis, obviously, a lot of people really love this game. It's big. It's sprawling. It's it's uh, it evokes all those feelings that you want from that from that. Um, Mechanica is cute and again, very accessible and interesting and in what it's doing. Uh, I, I don't know which way I would lean here. Well, the gameplay mechanic is probably more of our jam, so to speak. Uh, Nemesis does a good job as far as, like we said, like evoking that kind of alien slash doom kind of aesthetic and trying to deal with the people on the map as, again, like we talked about the the zombicide kind of world where it's just hacking, slashing, and shooting, but also with Nemesis, it's technically semi-cooperative. So... You have to complete objectives and such, and that does certainly play into the whole um, crossroad systems from Dead of Winter. So for that element, that it went a step forward more than just shooty, 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 bang, bang kind of stuff. Uh, I'm going to go with Nemesis. All right. Um, I think I'll go with uh, Mechanica. I I really do like the little. Sure. The the robots, by the way, are called tidy bots. Aw. You're trying to make the world a cleaner place. Um, so if we go over to the listeners and uh, followers, we see that Nemesis won with 92% of the vote. (laughs) Not surprising. That's all right. Most of those people were voting for Nemesis because they were taken over by the aliens. So yeah, yeah. Uh, already already been taken over. Yeah. Um, all right. So moving on to number eight versus number nine, we have black angel at Mm -hmm. number eight. This is the space version of Twa, effectively. Um, in which you are on this intergalactic ship that is comprised of only robots. The crew is all robots. So everything that gets done here is moving robots from one location to another. Those are your workers, and you send them out to do things. You put them in places. They take actions, and the actions you take are kind of reminiscent of what a robot would need to do in terms of like the amount of time it takes and where they come back and what you can automate and what you can't automate. So it's a very interesting mechanic. That you really kind of have to wrap your brain around your brain around to be able to play the game as well. Like mm. if you don't get into the mindset of these are all robots, <laughs> then it's really difficult to under you're thinking worker, but they're not that type of worker. Um versus number nine, and you'll notice that we dropped this down to number nine, um, largely because it's not primarily like a game about aliens, but mm. you are all playing aliens, and that's Twilight sure. Imperium fourth edition. Mm. So it is the big epic sprawling space opera of a game um and there are 17 unique uh alien races i guess 16 unique alien races and then there's humans which bleh, boring <laughs> or terrans whatever they're called um and they're all very asymmetrical and have very interesting elements to them that that makes them stand out mm-hmm. so um, we don't need to get in the mechanics of Twilight Imperium, just that part of it alone, like drafting your race is always a blast. Gotcha. Yeah. Black Angel has been kind of a challenge as far as play. I think you make a lot of sense as far as how to approach the game. 
uh, it's it's a good heavy euro game. It's it's a, there's a lot to love there. But Twilight Perium Four is Twilight Perium Four. <laughs> yeah, it it <laughs> is. Yeah, and it's it's <laughs> it's not the best Alien game. I don't it is think. Not. But at the same time, it is it is of these two the more interesting in terms of the decisions you're making. Absolutely. All right. So Twilight Imperium Four moves on to the next round. All right. Uh, next up, we have another game based on the Alien film franchise, except it's actually based on the Alien film franchise. Number five, Legendary Encounters, an alien deck building game. Um, for my money, the best of the Legendary Encounters deck building games. Uh, alien is very thematic. It's interesting. You have like the, the face huggers going into and out of the decks. Um, it's fully cooperative. The artwork is actually very good. This is back when they spent money on this stuff. <laughs> um, and it really just it kind of walks you through like this this franchise in a very interesting way. Um, number 12 is a bit of a niche game, but it's actually very interesting. And it's kind of stood out at all the conventions for years. Um, this was always the one that we'd gravitate towards. GKR Heavy Hitters. Mm-hmm. So you are playing as like giant mechs in this big cardboard city. And you are fighting it out because it is a combat sport, right? There's no aliens you're facing. You were just robots punching each other. <laughs> um, it's a lot of fun. It's, it's, I, I don't want to say mindless fun because there's a decent amount of complexity here. And the game is actually longer than you think it'd be for what it is. Sure. Um, the box is enormous. It was very expensive. I know they struggled to sell this because of all those things. Mm-hmm. Um, but like Weta Workshop was involved in this. So the designs are just legit very cool. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, I'll just throw my hat in there for, for GKR. I, I, I love this game as a giant robot game. It's like everything I could want. And for some reason, Rock'em Sock'em Robots didn't make it into the bracket. I don't know why, but <laughs> that's true. It, it had some legitimacy. I, I'm going to go for Legendary Encounters Alien just because I think it's hands down the best legendary system out there. And I think the idea of being taken over by the alien and, and playing in that role is such a twist to the game. I think it adds a lot. And I think, again, as you mentioned, this was one of the times where they didn't run out of money <laughs> during the production. They actually came up with new mechanics, came out with an interesting design, and it really is alien or aliens. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um all right, so if we hop on over to our list, see what people voted for. Hey, they all agree with you. Yay! Um, probably no one's heard of GKR. Aw, I see it every 96%, time. Yeah. 96% for uh, Legendary Encounters. All right, Legendary Encounters. Alien moves on to the next round. All right. A um, couple fun ones coming up here. We got Baseball Highlights 2045 at number four. Uh, it's a baseball game, but hey, guess what? Half of them are robots. What? Like cyborgs or androids or whatever they call them. Um, so that's fun. Just it's like weird and random, but it's fun. <laughs> um, versus number 13, the thing, infection at outpost 31, mm-hmm. is based on the thing, right? Which is Which probably is- one of the best, if not the best, alien movie of all time. It is definitely up there. And, yeah. and especially like the horror genre. Like, oh my there's god. Alien. There's Alien and there's The Thing. Like, it's those two. It's crazy good. If you haven't seen it, yeah. you should. But see the original. I'm just saying. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the remake's not. No. No, don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, you, you want the John Carpenter original. Yeah. Um, it's true. So, a couple, couple odd ones here. I, I mean, The Thing, I've, I've, the game does a very good job of representing mm-hmm. that that theme but it's also difficult to sure. do that theme well baseball highlights is just really weird and i love how weird it is it's like the weirdest <laughs> thing um and it's a good baseball game of which there are very few yes uh, and it's it's fun just to like build out your little team of all these robots and like the three naturals who somehow can still play baseball in a league full of robots <laughs> so it's true um it's a blast yeah both good games both kind of really implement the theme well Obviously, Aliens, I think, does a better job because it is following the movie. We reviewed this way back in the day. I think we, we reviewed Baseball Highlights 2045 as well. Yeah. It's hard because I think Aliens does a, Alien does a little bit more, but I think Baseball Highlights is a better game. 
and I I think I think they need to take another shot at the thing. And again, they've they've had other games like this, but it's it's a hard one for sure. Yeah, I, um, I'm gonna go with baseball highlights 2045. I I think it's just it's just a lot more fun to play. It's not as heavily themed, you know, mechanically gameplay wise, but it is. It is certainly like it makes sense, right? That you would have robots and that they, they do play differently than the human natural athletes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I'm with you. I, I love baseball twenty forty five. I love the thing as well, but I will just watch the movie. I really need that. So. <laughs> That's true. All right. Baseball highlights twenty forty five moves on to the next round. All right. Uh next up we have number six, Aquasphere. Oh, one of Stefan Feld's weirdest games in a good way, very <laughs> yes. much in a good way. Um, you you are playing as people. There's programmers, engineers, scientists in this underwater facility, but you have to reprogram these bots to to move around and take these various actions. So kind of similar to Black Angel thematically, but definitely not mechanically. Um, and there's a lot of interesting decisions you have to make here in terms of where you send them and how you kind of maneuver and manipulate around the board. Um, up against number 11 on Mars alien invasion. Now this is an expansion. I'm well aware, but um, it's one of the more robust expansions out there because it's from Vitala Cerda and it is you taking on Mars, which is just a straight hard sci-fi game and throwing in aliens like legit Martians. And there are some crazy, ridiculous, fun things that happen as a result in the four modules that he gives you. So um, that that's, it's a, it's one of the better, well, it's one of the best expansions, period, but especially for one of his games. A hundred percent, yeah. I think if you if it, if you add the expansion, it's on Mars, Alien Invasion. Uh, yeah. If you don't, then it's Aquasphere. Yeah, well, this is for the expansion only. Yeah. So. Well, you have to have the base game with that, too. Sure, yeah. yeah. But we're only considering the expansion for this, um, because... Otherwise, we're the aliens. But they have robots. So it's kind of, oh, yeah. they have robots yeah. on the planet. See? See, we did. It, it has both. That's it has true. Both. Well, then it definitely wins. It definitely wins. <laughs> it has both things. Yeah. Because you have to send the robots to the planet to do the things. And then it turns out, spoiler, alien, aliens? There's aliens. Yeah. yeah. Love it. So good. All right. So on Mars, alien, edition, alien invasion moves on to the next round. All right. Uh, next up, we have Cosmic Encounter at number three, which is literally just a box of aliens that do random things. Um, the game plays itself. Whatever. Uh, <laughs> versus number 14, Quirky Circuits, in which you are programming uh, little robot things, vacuum cleaners and cleaner robots and dogs to run around and clean up this house. Um, very cute, very fun game. Um, great for families. Uh, I... So for, for me on this one, I'll go first. I, I don't actually love Cosmic Encounter as a game. I've had too many experiences what? where the game just kind of fizzles out into nothing. No. Or, or I don't get to take a turn. I'm like, cool, look at my alien. That's I don't get to take a turn happen. because this game is stupid like that. Yeah. Um, it, it's fine if it happens occasionally. It happens a lot. I'd say like half the games just turn into some crazy nonsense. <laughs> um, which I know is why people love it, but it's, it's not for me. I did, uh, I but, did, I did play a game of it once, and I never played my turn because someone won before it got around yeah. the full table. So yes, That's ridiculous. That is the thing that happens in that game. But the reason I would vote for this one here is that there's like seventy five or eighty alien races uh -huh. that all have different powers and all do different things and yeah. all have different artwork, and that that alone is like enough to bring me to the table for the game. So. Uh, just the variety. It's not like, oh, Twilight Imperium has 17. Cosmic Encounter has like dozens, dozens of different aliens. That's all the game is. It's aliens in a box. It's true. So, love it. Yeah, it's it's a rough one because both, both do such a good job, but Cosmic Encounter really does lean into the, the concept of what would alien civilizations be, really be like? And how would they operate as as far as their special abilities concerned? And again, if, if if like you said, if there was like four or five aliens you had to choose from, eh, okay, that's not a big accomplishment. 
but the number of aliens here is um, immense. And again, yeah, it could mean that like some alien does a thing that kind of, you know, makes them win the game, but thematically it fits really well. So yes, 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 yes. Cosmic Encounter moves on to the next round. All right. All righty. So next up we have number seven, XCOM, the board game, which is a analog implementation of the video game XCOM. Um, in which you play members of this elite organization that has to defend Earth from an alien invasion. Um, so the thing about this one, though, that was very controversial is that it runs off of an app. It's real time. Um, had some very interesting, fun, cool things that it did, but I don't really like real time games. So <laughs> it never really stuck for me. Um, and then Burn Cycle on the other side. In, and this one is from Chip Theory Games. It's one of their big giant boxes. This has some very cool artwork in it, in which you are playing the leader of a team of robots who are trying to take down corporations who are subjugating AI. So you're like counter revolutionary robots. Awesome. Super cool. Yeah. Um, it It's just a very cool theme. I've looked at this game several times and been like, I love everything it says it's doing. I don't know if I'll love the the actual mechanics of the experience enough to go in on like a $200 game. It's a big price tag. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It's very expensive, but I love like the orange aesthetic. It's very cool. Very cool. Just like, it's a fun thing. So um, on vibes alone, I'm voting for burn cycle because I, I think it just does everything I would want. And it's just a cool thing. Anything that's future where it's just like, let's all take down the corporations because they're terrible. And also you're a robot. I'm like, yes. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> Yeah, again, I mean, I XCOM does a very good job, but I've seen and played a lot of that kind of hidden movement mechanic kind of, you know, app-based AI kind of stuff, and it gets kind of boring very quickly. Uh, Bird Cycle, on the other hand, is very cool, and the AI aspect of the game is a lot of fun. So I'm going to go Bird Cycle as well. All right. So that means Burn Cycle moves on to the next round. All right. Number two, Robo Rally. The classic uh, from Richard Garfield and Michael Davis, where you program these robots and they run around these little courses. Versus <laughs> number 15, Alien Frontiers from uh, Corey Neiman. And this is a game about being a deep space colonist and going out into the world, finding alien life, building a fleet, settling colonies. It's one of the like defining worker placement games going sure. back to like 2010. Yeah. Um, and also had those very cool little dice with, with some of the upgraded editions of the game. Yeah. This is one of the first major kickstars back in the day. Yeah. Uh, both good games. I, I actually am a big fan of alien frontiers. I own a copy, played a copy, love the copy. Uh, I want to vote for the copy. <laughs> <laughs> I, I play I've played Robo Rally a lot and I, I always appreciate it when you see it at the conventions and people actually put a gigantic version of that down. Mm -hmm. I the programming for the game makes a lot of sense. It's just so smart, right? If you're gonna have robots, you're gonna have pre-programming. They move around, they do things, you're trying to get to your destination, stuff like that. I don't find that as much fun because it's programming, and then I think I played it a couple times where I was like Let's try random. And it works just as well because, again, you can't, <laughs> you can't possibly manage all the different things that are happening out there on the board. So, yeah. Uh, I don't know. It should be Rolo Robo Rally, but I'm voting for Alien Frontiers because I think I like the game better. It's just <laughs> there's very little alien in it, but it's, it's, it's a better game. Yeah. That's, it's fair. I, I haven't really spent a lot of time with Alien Frontiers. Robo Rally is very cool. Creative and clever. I'm yes. going to vote for Robo Rally. All right. So that leaves it up to the fans out there, Anthony. What do they have to say? All right. So the fan, this one was very close for a two versus 15. Um, the fans picked 55% for Robo Rally. Boo. I mean, it makes <laughs> sense, but boo. I get yeah. it, but boo. All right. So Robo yeah. Rally moves on to the next round. But to be All fair, right. it was programmed that way. So we couldn't do it. It was always going to move on. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's what it does. <laughs> Hey everybody, we are super pleased to announce our new sponsor, Marvel Strike Force. Marvel Strike Force is a mobile squad RPG that allows you to battle with your favorite team of superheroes and supervillains in a fight to save the universe. 
against threats like Doctor Doom and Apocalypse. The goal? Power up your favorite characters to complete missions, unlock gear and other resources, and beat other players in PvP modes such as Alliance War and Real-Time Arena. And the best part? Marvel Strike Force just reached its six-year anniversary, which means free stuff when you sign up via our unique link in the description. The anniversary consists of weekly events and bonuses. Just complete each event and you'll receive special awards and skins. Make sure to log in each day and every week to take advantage of all the new characters that are being released specifically for this event. This will be Marvel Strike Force's most generous event to date, so don't miss out. If we have received a unique promo code for every new user, please follow our link in the description and use the promo code MAXPOOL, M-A-X-P-O-O-L. Again, anybody uses that code, it is unique for all new users. Check it out. Once again, thank you so much to Marvel Strike Force for sponsoring this episode. All right, uh, next up, we have the this next grouping of games is Samurai Games, just Samurai, uh, Medieval Japan, mm -hmm. versus Medieval Europe. So Ooh. I guess people put it that way. Medieval Japan versus Medieval Europe. Um, so first up, the number one seed is Samurai. Oh! Uh -huh. classic Reiner Knizia abstract game um, in which you are moving little pieces around kind of an abstract -y tile hex map of Japan. Uh, versus number 16, The Duke, which is also an abstract game. Yes, I did this on purpose. Uh, <laughs> <Damn it. laughs> in which you're playing, it's basically the chess-like pieces where you have like bishops and knights and various things um, on these tiles that flip over whenever you take an action. So each side will tell you what it can do and you flip it. So it, it is chess-like, but also very difficult to keep track of where you're going. Um, which abstract does it better, Samurai or the Duke? They're both pretty damn abstract, Anthony. I'll, I'll have you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I have both of them. I really like both of them. And... Mm, all right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say Samurai. Because I just... I just feel like out of the Battle of the Abstracts, Samurai is more true thematically to the game, at least art-wise, art uh, than what, again, was one of my favorite games of all time, The Duke. I I think is exactly what I would say. Like, I love The Duke. I play it more. But yes. Samurai is, is more a representation of medieval Japan. And it's a good representation, it, too. So, yeah. Appreciate it. Yeah. All right. So, I mean, Samurai moves on to the next round. All right, uh, next up, number eight, Lancaster from Matthias Kramer um, versus number nine, Samurai Spirit. I feel like this is like, <laughs> I feel like you could just dunk on this. Oh, I could spend all day dunking on this. I, I don't, yeah. yeah. Uh, how, how much longer do we have on this episode? <laughs> well, I don't know, man, how much do we want to go? Uh... <laughs> all right, uh, we've reviewed both of these. We've reviewed all these games at some point or the other. and. Sure. Uh, one game is one of the more or less best games of this type because it does thematically does so many things right and it has some really interesting gameplay and the other one Samurai Spirit <laughs> <'Cause> yeah. it's, <laughs> it's kind of broke and it doesn't really work and it, I don't know how much time do we have left <laughs> so Lancaster I, for me yeah yeah me too like I always wanted to like Samurai Spirit Antoine Bowser, cool artwork, fun theme. Yeah. Game. It's no good. I don't I know how it's this high ranking. I, I got it way back, like, first run, and I was like, designer, awesome, artwork, fantastic, you know, quick gameplay, down for it, and nope. <laughs> Not so much. Yeah. Sadly, we, sadly, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's no good. Lancaster. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> and we should say Lancaster is a very interesting good game. We kind of skipped over this, but it's about the unification of England, mm -hmm. and it's like these, you're maneuvering knights around to build influence, and it has this big map of England. It's cool. It's a very cool game. And you also get to do a lot of interesting, you know, conceptual things where, like, you're building a castle, and you're putting the different, you're putting the different parts of the castle together, giving you special abilities and stuff, too, and it's really fun and tense, and I like it a lot, and it really deserves a reprint. Uh, and Matthias Kramer is a genius, so take it somewhere other than Queen. I'm just just saying. <laughs> take it somewhere that they can do like super fun version of it because it's very that'd be cool. Yes. 
All right. Next matchup, we have another game from Queen. <laughs> oh, no. Shogun, which is actually on Kickstarter right now just for reprints. Yes. Um, Very good. Shogun game. is mm-hmm. a re- re-implementation of Wallenstein in, in the sense that it has the cube tower. Right? Yes. There's the three versions from Queen with the cube tower, Wallenstein, Shogun, and Immortals. They all do slightly different things. But it's basically an area control game over the map of Japan. It's very good. It's a lot of fun. It takes place in the Warring States period, so like 15th, 16th century or so, um, and you're trying to become the Shogun. Right. Uh, Versus number 12, and honestly, I feel like I would vote for Shogun over almost anything else in this bracket, but this is how it all fell down. Mm -hmm. Um, Shadows over Camelot, Mm. which is obviously a little more fantastical version of medieval Europe, but most things are. which is a cooperative slash semi-cooperative deduction-based game based on the round table and the knights uh, of King Arthur and trying to find the Holy Grail and all that good stuff. Um, brilliant game, been out of print forever, but uh, which is a shame. I wish wish someone would pick this up. Both games are great. I mean, both games are legitimately great. And I can't fault anybody for going for either one because they're both great. And yeah, Shogun's out there, and even the it's on streaming too. They redid Shogun, at least the uh, original TV play. Oh yeah, um, Shadows of Camelot. It's Shadows of Camelot. It's it's a hidden traitor mechanic done in one of the better ways, or one of the best ways, at least one, at least on the early versions of it. And then, like you said, it's King Arthur's Camelot. Gameplay is a little more simplified, but again, it allows you to play out the other aspects of the game more dynamically so i don't know anthony what are you going for here because i could go either way could flip all the coins <sighs> yeah i think i'm still gonna go for shogun i thought i was gonna do camelot but i'm gonna go with shogun because it's just the the mechanics match the theme so well and it's i wish again like you said with lancaster i wish it wasn't queen games because what they say the msrp is on this thing is ridiculous yeah it shouldn't be that but it is a great great game it's my it's up there with Alhambra for me, with or like Dirk Hen games. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I'm going with Shogun. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta pick one, man. Oh, no. I like, I like, I, I like these games. <laughs> I don't want the games to go away, Anthony. They're both, they're both wonderful and they're fanciful. Uh, Yeah, I'm gonna go with Shadows over Camelot. I, I, I just, I agree with what you're saying about Shogun, and it's just, it's such a good game. I think Shadows of Camelot does well by the the, the Camelot story, the 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 Mithar- Arthur Arthurian legend here. The the trailer mechanic is great. The production is stellar, and it was, you know. Days of Wonder back in the day when Days of Wonder was Days of Wonder. So, all right. So we go to the voters, and the voters say sixty-five percent for Shadows over Camelot. All right, Shadows of Camelot moves on to the next round. Big upset there. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a classic, worthy. Um, all right. Next up, we have number four, Tainted Grail: The Fall of Avalon. So another. <laughs> this is like even more kind of divergent from what we're getting. We got Arthurian legends and Celtic mythology kind of put into a blender Mm -hmm. and see what we get out of it. Um, Up against number 13, Senjutsu Battle for Japan, Mm -hmm. um, which is a relatively recent game, but it's a samurai dueling game with um, kind of a, you've got miniatures, but it's also card-based deck construction where you're building up these decks to to go up against each other. Um, So it plays one to four, but it's generally considered better at two. Um, what do you think? Big bloated box of stuff from Awaken Realms. <laughs> it's one way to it's one way to put it. <laughs> yeah, people people love these games, and I honestly I haven't played this one, so I can't say it's bad. Um, it's it's one of, like I eyeballed it forever. I know what it's about. I thought the theme was very interesting, but it's just like that amount of boxes. I was like, don't have space for it. Um, but you know, it's fun to call it bloated. Yes, it's it's definitely the yeah because it's it's bloated with love. 
because loaded with love. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. Uh, again, both very good games, both really nice miniature games. One is epic in scale. One is obviously streamlined down to a you know fine point. I'm going to go Senshu here, Anthony. I think it just, as far as, since both games are great, I'm going to go down with gameplay mechanics here and just, I want the essential experience. And I think you do get this here. Yeah, Senshu too for me, for sure. Yeah, like it's, again, it, the streamlining is huge. It's mm-hmm. an affordable game. You get it for like $45. Um, you get some very cool looking miniatures. There's like a cherry tree standy. Mm-hmm. It's very cool. Very cool. Absolutely. Yeah, people should check it out if they haven't yet. All right, Sentinchu. Battle for Japan moves on to the next round. All right. Uh, next up we have number six, <laughs> the Resistance Avalon, or the Avalon Big Box, I guess is what you can get now, mm-hmm. the new art, versus number 11, Ikusa. So Avalon, classically, it's the resistance, it's Avalon, it's whatever. It's a hidden role. It's a hidden trader game, hidden loyalty game. Yeah, social deduction. Social deduction there game. Yeah. Merlin's in there too. Right. So you have 23 different characters representing some general roles, but also like specific people. Like you got your Lancelots and your Excalibur and your sorcerers. Um versus Akusa, which is an old game from 1986. Um has also gone by names such as Samurai Swords and Shogun. It was mass produced at one point by Milton Bradley. Um, it's like a bunch of cheap plastic <laughs> running around <laughs> on the map uh, playing through Shogunate in Japan. Um, so you've got a big map of stuff. you got a bunch of different people. It's, it's got like a risk-like type of approach, but much more narrow scope. This is, this is old school. This is old. I'm going to go old school, Anthony. I think I think the production here, even though it is old school, even though it's back in the day, that kind of cheap plastic throwback, I think it certainly does feel thematically what you're playing. Whereas the Avalon side is good. I love the fact that Merlin comes into play and you have to pick out the traitor here, but there isn't too much here for me, at least. Uh, yeah, I'm with you. I, I've never really liked <laughs> resistance avalon at all um and it doesn't really feel like if i honestly if i felt like i was playing through that i'd probably like it more like shadows over camelot i like more yeah i i, I own a copy of avalon it's the best version for me i own a lot of copies of resistance as well but yeah no doubt all right okay next up we have number three rising sun it is eric lang's big medieval japan game um but Based, they're certainly samurai in the game, but it's certainly more focused on the kind of mythology of Japan than it is on like the actual life in feudal Japan. Um, versus number 14, Crusaders, Thy Will Be Done, um, from the now defunct Tasty Minstrel games, in which you play as you guessed it, Crusaders, Knights moving out to spread the order, the Templar order. Um, what do we got here? We've got like the mythological version with kind of poor research done versus <laughs> Crusaders, which has always made me feel a little icky. Yeah. And I don't know why. <laughs> wow. Well, yeah. Just as a theme. Crusades. Um, yeah. Crusades. Yeah. What's an icky time? Uh, it is good representation of that icky time. Yes. Um, whereas but Rising Sun is just a big bloated box of plastic. But it's a bloated. <laughs> box of love anthony so i'm gonna rise in sun because yeah me too i can't vote for crusaders <laughs> but i i just rising sun is not my favorite but at the same time there are elements of it where you're like you didn't even look this up this is not what this that that one doesn't exist what are you doing <laughs> box of love anthony box of love man <laughs> box of love box of love it's a box That's of true. love i should i should love it more i paid 250 dollars for it whatever that was <laughs> Not bitter at all. Not bitter at all, folks. No, no, no. Um, all right. Next up, number seven, oh, no. Yedo. <laughs> yes. No. Uh, this is re- recently deluxified. Yes. Um, this is taking place in the city of Edo um, at the time of the, the launch of the Tokugawa Shogunate. Uh, and there's a lot of stuff going on in this game. It's not specifically about being a samurai, but that's certainly part of it. So... <laughs> You're trying to catch the shogun's attention and um, basically work your way up 
Yeah, you're, the latter. you're running missions, and it's kind of it's often compared to Lords of Waterdeep because they came out mm, yeah. about the same time. But uh, people should know Yido came out first, so like it's the comparison's not f- fair because usually it's it's beaten on Yido. Yido is very good. Uh, I like it a lot. Own a copy of it, not the deluxified super version, but the original version. Because I'm OG that way. <laughs> you are OG. That way. <laughs> uh, that's good. Um, so it, you know, it's going up against citadels, and so again, kind of an abstract version of medieval Europe, right? You have all these kind of um, yeah, like you, you have your magicians and your thief and your king and your warlord and mm-hmm. your architect and your merchants and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, it's a great game. It's a lot of fun. I think it's the most I like any game that's this type of game. Sure. Um, like the hidden roles and like stabbing each other all the time. <laughs> There's just a lot of games I don't like that do that. This one, for whatever reason, is charming to me. Yeah. Um, with that Bruno Fiduti uh, pixie dust on it. Uh, it doesn't really feel like the theme, though. This kind of comes back to like the what we were talking about before yeah uh citadels is so good because you're targeting the characters in the game that are chosen from basically like you know a drafting so instead of you know choosing a particular character to try to knock out and you're building a city so there's some tableau building and some special abilities that goes out but really the selection of the characters is really what's key in the game so it is certainly more of an abstract kind of city builder with some of the main players in that kind of medieval theme, but it is certainly, in my opinion, the best of it as far as a social deduction game is concerned. I own both copies of it and I've always loved it. So, but as you said, you know, is certainly absolutely positively more true of thematic gameplay. So I don't want to do it because Citadels is one of my favorite games of all time, typically on my top 100, but you know. All right. Ditto. All right. You know, moves on to the next round. All right. Uh, Next up, we have number two, Paladins of the West Kingdom, which is admittedly not actual Europe, but the kind of Night kind of stuff. Fancified yeah. version that Shem Phillips came up with, with the West Kingdom. But it's West Francia and they're facing Vikings and there's Byzantines from the east and like it's 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 basically Europe, right? Uh medieval times. Uh and you're playing against these different paladins, you're trying to build up and, and protect the land against the invaders. Um up against number fifteen, Seki Gahara. Uh so this is almost a more political take on everything, which samurai are inherently political. They're often many of them are uh, officials, and so you are dealing with the Battle of Sekigahara in sixteen hundred um, that led to the Tokugawa shogunate. So you are going up against um, you are either Ishida Mitsunari or Tokugawa I- I- Ieyasu, and you're trying to like relitigate that war. So it's a war game, effectively. Um, and trying to determine who's going to come out on top at this very pivotal time in Japanese history. Uh, so it's a big GMT game. It's long. It's two players only. Um, it's wood blocks. So it's a very specific type of game, but it's also very good. Um, versus Paladins, which does a good job of kind of characterizing and representing that everything about that Western European theme. Well, Anthony... I- Again, one is more of a serious historical take and one is more of a fantasyful quasi-historical elements kind of thing. But uh, again, thematic gameplay, I want to unify to Japan, Anthony. Sikagara. Ooh, okay. That's interesting. Uh, I think I have to go with you on that. Yeah, I... I... I thought you were going to go with Paladins, and then I assumed that the readers would also go with Paladins. <laughs> I was loose, but Sekigahara, yeah, let's go with it. All right. Well, there's your biggest upset of the day. Number 15 taking number two. Sekigahara moves on to the next round. All right. So that moves on to our last chunk of stuff. We've got Vikings versus Cowboys. Uh, this is a fun one. There's a lot of really good games in here. Mm-hmm. So 
We're going to kick it off with number one, Vikings. Just Vikings. Michael Kiesling's long out of print Vikings, mm-hmm. um, which I have a copy of somewhere, somehow. <laughs> somehow which I have Which is now this. out of print. Uh, it's very out of print. Yeah. Yeah, it's a, I've tried to find it before because mine's pretty battered. Uh, and this is a kind of a, a drafting type of game. And when you're taking these Vikings and building out these different islands and then the different colors of Vikings represent different things they can do, right? Um, going on voyages or pillaging or growing stuff. Because not all Vikings were pillagers. Uh, versus Wild Tiled West, which is a new game from Paul Denon, who is the kind of major designer at Direwolf and the designer behind things like Dune Imperium and Clank. Hmm. Um, and, and this is a Wild West game in which you are laying out different tiles and building towns, right? It's a big tile laying game. Um, there's polyominoes involved. Lots of polyominoes involved. <laughs> um, I don't own a copy of this game. I thought I would like it. I did demo it. I've tried it. I've played it a couple times. And it's definitely in my wheelhouse, but a little lighter than I would expect or enjoy. But it's a cool experience. Um, it honestly, it reminds me of Clank's take on deck building. Where I'm like, this is cool, and I love how it's different, but it's a little lighter than I would like. Uh, so, yeah. Those are my takes. Yeah, I, th- I think both are abstracted versions thematically. The one I'd rather play is Vikings, to be honest. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Vikings for sure for me. It's in my top 100. Mm-hmm. I, I love this game. Um, I, I wish it, it would come back. This is this would be huge on Kickstarter. It would. For me, at least. Certainly. All right. All right. Next up, we have number eight. Bang the dice game. Cowboys shooting each other. <laughs> it's true. Um. <laughs> And that's it. You roll dice. It's it's Yahtzee ish, but then there's dynamite that blows you up. Yeah, <laughs> but also there's different roles and stuff that. Yeah. yeah, there's a lot going on here. And the thing about this game is like you can play with up to eight people. Mm-hmm. The more people, the better. The more chaotic it is. There are hidden roles as well, like you said, um, that determine like you're trying to figure out who everybody is so that you can figure out who you're supposed to be shooting. So it, it's like a very active dice version of werewolf. Um, very w- wild westy. Uh, and so that's going up against Champions of Midgard, which is the, you know, we talked about Yeddo being like Lords of Waterdeep, but with Samurai. This is like Lords of Waterdeep, but with Vikings. Um, but there's dice involved. So you go on these missions, you roll the dice that you're kind of accumulating to take out these objectives that you're facing. Um, so, yeah, good one. 100% agree. I, I think they're both good, fun games. I think one of the surprising things. You know, as far as the game's concerned, especially if you want to get a number of people to the table and have all those different roles and just have a lot of good fun at the table. Bang! The dice game for me, Anthony. All right. Uh, for me, it's Champions of Midgard. Right. I, I think it's just a really fun, clever, accessible Viking game. Mm-hmm. All right. That leaves it up right. to the fans, Anthony. What do they have to say? All righty, so between Bang the Dice Game and Champions of Midgard, 74% choose Champions of Midgard. All right, Champions of Midgard moves on to the next round. All right, next up we have number five, Eric Lang's back, Blood Rage. Blood Rage. <laughs> it's coming for us. Uh, it's, uh, it's you got a drafting game, you've got Ragnarok, you've got big monsters on the board, it's Vikings, but also you know, uh, Norse mythology. So it, it's everything I said about Rising Sun, except I like it a lot more. <laughs> <laughs> you don't say. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and then number 12 is Pioneer Days. <clears throat> and so Pioneer Days is a like a dice rolling game in which you are uh, kind of building out your little town or tableau of different things. Um, that's all, you know, cowboy and, and Wild West themed. Um, the Dice you take play have different actions on them that correspond to different things you're able to do in this town. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's kind of it just falls on that like midweight euro thing that I think everybody like there's a million of those and they sure. come out all the time, so it just kind of skidded by. But it's cute artwork, it was plays very quickly, um, had a lot of interesting um ideas in it, and uh, just kind of disappeared because it was a tasty minstrel game that didn't do great. So, Aww. Makes a lot of sense. Oh. Good games. But Anthony, Blood Rage. It's Blood Rage. Blood yeah, Rage. That's, that's, I like Pioneer Days fine. And I owned it for a little while. But Blood Rage. 
All right, Blood Rage moves on to the next round. All right, next up, number four, Colt Express. We got we got cowboys. We got different people related to cowboys. They're jumping on this train. It's 3D. It's amazing. It's it's great. Um, so you could get a DeLorean and put it back there from Back to the Future Three. It's it's a promo. It's great. <laughs> um, going up against number thirteen, Nar. Nar You're building a Viking crew. Um. You have to build up your Viking band, you go on this different adventures, and you're trying to, I don't know, figure out where you're going to explore. It's, it's like a tableau builder type of thing in the set collection. Um, pretty light and abstract. Not abstract, but just, it's a light game. Yeah, this is a rough one, because again, they both kind of fit the same, you know, game weight space. Um, both are pretty fun. Uh, obviously, once more programming, once more of that kind of lightweight kind of entry level. I'm going to go with NAR, Anthony. NAR. Uh, I'm going to go with Colt Express. I, I love me some uh, programming. Robbery. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently, yeah, Robo Rally and Colt Express. <laughs> um, all right, well, we go to the voters and Colt Express. All right. Two thirds of the vote. Colt Express moves on to the next round. All right. Um, next up, we have number six, Carson City, which I know is a favorite of yours. It it's is. Worker placement with cowboys. Worker placement with cowboys and varmints and outlaws and school teachers and a lot of different roles that you get to play as as you battle against other worker placement on the table and also as you build up your town with resources. Uh, your banks and all the other kind of fun stuff. Great production, great gameplay, and a very vicious worker placement game. Uh, so yeah, uh, lots of fun at the table there. Yeah. Um, so that's going up against number eleven, Raiders of the North Sea, which is worker placement with Vikings. It's true. I've played that as well. It's worker placement with Vikings, Anthony. It is, yeah. So, which which worker placement with whatever do you think is better? I'm gonna go with whatever you say here because I don't think I played either of these. <laughs> no, so. I've played both of them. I mean, Raiders of the North Sea. Just just making a joke there is is a good game. It's not a bad game by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, again, I think in I I think it's one of Shem Phillips' best versions of this game. I played it not too long ago, and I and I we we reviewed it and such. Good game. But Carson City is a classic for a reason. The production is next level. The the building of the town is unlike anything I've ever seen. And you really do play as the different characters. They all have special abilities. And you you have shootouts. And people could take over your land. And the sheriff can get involved. So Cult Express. I mean, it's not Cult Express. It really is a very much detailed Wild Wild West game. So Carson City. All right, Agreed. so that means Carson City was on to the next round. All right, uh, next up, we have a very easy one, I think, at least from my perspective. <laughs> Number three, 878 Vikings, Invasions of England, um, mm -hmm. a two-player asymmetrical uh, war game kind of based on the 1776 system, but set in, in Europe um, from Academy Games, one of my favorite two-player games, uh, versus Number 14, Doomtown Reloaded which is, by all accounts, a very good kind of Midwestern-themed IP-style um, card game, but 878 Vikings, right? 878 Vikings? <laughs> I always think that's a phone number. <laughs> I know. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's 878 Vikings. Uh, historical reenactment, two-player game, but you could play as four-player, and it still works really well. A lot of little modules that really open the game up. Doomtown Reload is a, is a really damn good uh you know deck building game with a lot of different expansions and decks you can kind of play with but 878 vikings like doomtown could stand but not not this battle here no all right 878 vikings moves on to the next round all right uh <laughs> this next matchup is gonna make you mad but um <laughs> number seven a feast for odin we talked about this at length uve rosenberg's Weird most weirdly sprawling shaped food game, game. Weirdly yep. shaped food game. <laughs> yep, weirdly shaped food game. Uh, so it's it's worker placement, but also polyamino laying, but also 
collection, but also tableau building. There's a billion things going on here. And for me, it comes together amazingly. And yeah, somewhere in there, your Vikings going on this epic journey. Love it. Um, versus number <laughs> 10, flick them up, in which you are flicking around little bullets from your cowboys. Um, you set up this little town and just flicking stuff all over the table. Um, clever, fun take on dexterity game with a Western theme. Uh, I don't know if you want me to say it. I mean, they're both good games. One has weirdly shaped food and one has weirdly shaped bullets. That's true. That's true. <laughs> so they're both weirdly shaped. Uh, both a lot of fun out there. I don't know. Anthony, convince me it's a feast for Odin. Uh, thematically. Have... Thematically. No, I don't want to. <laughs> no, thematically. Thematically. I mean, so is I it? mean, is it? it? Is. Okay. okay. Right. So in, in a feast for Odin, right? One of the core mechanics is that you are getting materials to build boats to be able to go out on journeys, right? You're Vikings. They're right. trading boats and there are attacking boats and whaling boats. So the various ways that Vikings would go out and interact with the ocean. Uh, and these are a huge part of the game. So you have to be able to get these boats. You can play the game without them, but it's very difficult, especially if somebody else does it well. Um, you need to have the right boats in the right order and have the right actions to be able to go out and to plunder and to capture on this separate board, the plunder, which is really weirdly shaped stuff. <laughs> <laughs> I think the other stuff's weirdly shaped. This stuff's super weirdly shaped. Um, and you get things like crowns and crosses and shields and, and all sorts of cool stuff. Um, but then when you're ready to migrate your people, get off of this terrible rock that you live on and move on, you have to give up the boat, right? Which costs a bunch of stuff because you are now leaving. And now there's fewer people to feed because you're gone. You've gone to the new world. You've gone to Greenland or wherever you've moved to. Um, so like the theme is definitely there. It's just surrounded by a bunch of mechanics, um, which I love. So either way, it's great. All right. A feast for Odin moves on Yay, to the next round. I did it. <laughs> I, I'm positive our listeners probably supported me on that one, but <laughs> I don't want to look just in case. Um, all right. Last but not least, we have number two, Western Legends which is the big sandbox cowboy game, um, mm -hmm. which I've actively avoided because everybody told me, it's like, oh, if you don't like uh, sandbox games, you won't like this. I'm like, I don't like sandbox games, so I've not played it. Um, up against number 15, PAX Vikings, which is, the, I think, the most recent PAX game in which you are playing a historical strategy game of trade and diplomacy set in the 10th century with Vikings. So less about the stabby stabby and more about like trade and diplomacy of that time of, of like basically managing the seas. Um, I don't even know here. I just don't. I, <laughs> Pax I Vikings mean, did not do it for me at all, but I, there's no way I would enjoy Western legends. I, I mean, I've played both and okay, good. <laughs> Glad. Uh, both are okay. I mean, they're not the best. Both are okay. Western legends has its elements to it. As far as, like you said, the sandbox game where you could do, a lot of different things. But as far as gameplay goes and thematic essence, more or less, it's very soap opery. Whereas mm -hmm. Pax Vikings is really, you're actually doing things that make a difference sure. in the game. So I'm going to go with Pax Vikings. I'm going to go with what you said. Cause All right. I would like this. I don't, again, I didn't love it, but I really don't think I like Western legends just looks kind of schlocky. <sighs> The the sandbox element of it is fine, and you can do different things, but it is not as it's not spaghetti western, which I think is what they were looking for. It just doesn't right. feel that way. It just feels like I'm kind of running off and doing my own thing. You're doing your own thing, and every once in a while we come into contact. So, uh, right. Pax Vikings, big upset moves on to the next round. All right, that's it, folks. That's all 32 matchups for this week. So if you want to hear the rest, come back next week. And we're going to do, do the do. rest. And you do. You, you should. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, so we're going to go through uh, the remaining 32 games uh, from the four different brackets. And we're going to whittle them all the way down to the top number one uh, game and therefore theme. Whichever game it is, that theme is the best. So It's true. That's how that works. Whichever, whichever one of these comes out on top. That's what we're doing. So let it be um, written. So let it be done. I hope it's not zombies, but other than that, we're good. Could be. Could, Could be. be. Good zombie <laughs> games in there. I was thinking also, Aquasphere. 
the octopi in Aquasphere? Could they have been aliens? Oh, they could have been aliens. Because they, they, they do more than just normal octopuses do. Yeah, yeah, they're very smart. Hmm? All right. Just let, let's okay. all leave that at that and just try to contemplate that. Cause, yeah, I'll think on it. Yeah. Because if, if on Mars could have robots and aliens, then Aquasphere could have aliens and robots as well. That would Absolutely. be a great mashup. Hmm. Yeah. All right. That's everything for this time. Until next time, this is Chris. And this is Anthony. And we'll save you all a seat at the table. Take care, everyone. Bye.